we are going to be diving into squip phases one through three today. Um, but before we get into the content, we always like to introduce ourselves. Uh, for those of you who have never been here before, my name is Danielle. I am a supplier wiki researcher, so I help organize and research some of the content that you see. And then leading our content today is Peter, our senior supplier wiki writer. Peter is our content machine. He is the one who um, that you can most likely find writing all the content for like our ebooks, our webinars, our articles, or cheat sheets, all resources that can be found on our supplier wiki website. So Peter is, he's incredible. And then moving on, as we go through Squib phases one through three, some topics that you can expect to see throughout the webinar. Um, firstly, we're going to do a quick outline on what the Squib program is, who and um, who is not affected, and then just a brief overview of the program. Then we'll go through Squib phases one through three, how to dispute potential Squib fines, and finally, we will end it off with a Q&A at the end. So please submit any questions that you have along the way. All right, so here are a, a few FAQs that we typically get during webinars. So first being, will we be getting a copy of the slide deck? Yes, absolutely. You can expect to see the PDF version of the slide deck as well as the recording of the webinar appear in your email inbox. So the email that you use to um, register for this webinar, it will appear in that email inbox in about three to four business days. Also, all of our recordings are on our Supplier Wiki website. So if for, for some reason you lose the email, you can always go to YouTube or our website, which is supplierwiki.supplypike.com to find the slide deck as well as uh, several other free educational resources. And then secondly, what is the best way to ask a question? So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat tab and then you'll see a Q&A tab. So the chat tab will be a great place to submit any insights or to engage in conversation. Um, I may put in a few uh, resources in that chat tab as Peter's going through uh, the content. And then the Q&A tab has two little speech bubbles. And this is where we ask you to please submit any questions related to the content as I'll be able to monitor them and then tee them up for Peter for the Q&A time at the end. All right. So last little thing before we get into the content, if you are new to our webinars or have never heard of Supply Pike, we are a Northwest Arkansas based software company who helps suppliers reduce revenue loss by detecting compliance issues and fighting them through business logic and automation. We do this in a lot of different ways and with multiple different retailers like Walmart, Target, Amazon and Kroger. And just a little shout out, we work with a lot of great suppliers across the box in almost every product category. We have some of them up here today. Um, and if your logo is not up here, we would love to see it at some point. We love to work with suppliers to help reduce revenue loss and win back money owed. And we would love to do that for you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter to get in today's content. Thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yes, today we're going to be talking about the Supplier Quality Excellence Program. The uh, You can think of it kind of as like the third major installment in the um, in the uh, Walmart kind of revenue loss world. After regular AP deductions, we have two compliance programs, OTIF and SQUEP. Um, and it is the um, most recent of the three, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm going to, uh, we've got a ton of things to cover today. I want, um, this webinar is designed to cover basically all of the existing phases of SQUEP, um, everything that's kind of in effect right now. So I want to kind of treat it as if, you know, if, if this is your first exposure to kind of this program or this concept that will cover the bases, but I also want to get a little bit deeper into each of the phases as well. So um, uh, I'll be kind of flying over this at a, at a kind of like a high level at the beginning, especially. Um, but yeah, basically it's kind of introduced or goes into effect on February 1st of 2021. And um, it the uh, it covers right now um, these three main areas. Uh, these are the ways that Walmart has kind of described um, what the program is covering. Um, PO accuracy, barcode and labeling, packaging, load and pallet quality. Um, and the zero-based mindset, um, the kind of mantra of SQUEP, is really just kind of a way of describing 
their um, very high standards uh, for um, their suppliers kind of moving forward. The uh, 98% on time, 98% in full um, goal of OTIF, of the OTIF program um, with SQUEP, they're basically kind of just following up on that to say, hey, um, it's going to be uh, we we demand perfection basically from your supply chain. So um, yes, that's kind of the spirit um, the spirit of the SWEP program. So uh, who is actually subject to SWEP and who is not? All suppliers of Walmart um, shipping to DCs in the continental U.S. Um, are gonna are are the kind of the main recipients, I guess, if you will, of the program, uh, including FCs. So that's really big suppliers. For e-com, uh, e e-commerce, e and dot-com are uh, subject to it as well, as long as, again, it's going through those DCs in the continental U.S. Um, direct import suppliers, and the caveat here is that OTIF doesn't apply, but SQUEP does. So, again, a lot of people think of OTIF and SQUEP as kind of part and parcel of the same thing, and they are. They're both kind of compliance, but they're not programs that communicate with each other, and they're not programs that are completely aligned on everything, and this is one of the major differences. Um, uh, direct import suppliers are free from the OTIF kind of regulations, but um, not from SQUEP. Uh, so DSDC uh, shipments are also uh, regulated by SQUEP, um, but there's some exceptions uh, here as well. Some groups that uh, don't have a SQUEP program yet. I believe that SAMS still doesn't. Uh, SAMS has kind of teased a, a, a SQUEP kind of equivalent. Um, but I believe that we still haven't seen it yet, but definitely let us know in the chat if that has changed um, uh, what all you've heard about that. Um, Canada and Mexico, right? Again, not continental uh, US um, DCs, so they don't apply. Same for Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Alaska. Uh, D99 and D90X suppliers, I believe those are just kind of like internal use like cleaning supplies and shelving stuff and so it's not um uh it's not in the same kind of category as a regular supplier would be those shipments are uh are not subject to squat fines as well dsds and dsvs are not too kind of for obvious reasons i think especially with um uh drop ship you know it's the idea is kind of uh, well, it's a whole different form of of supplying, if you want to see it that way. So uh, it's connected to some kinds of rev loss. You could still see some kind of AP deductions, uh, but it's not the same thing. So um, it's not getting the full kind of brunt of the SQUEP program. Some major apps that are connected to this program that uh, hopefully you're kind of familiar with a little bit already. If you're if you're doing some reporting to a CFO or something like that. Uh, the SQUEP scorecard is really important for just kind of conceptualizing at a high level, what's our business, how's our business doing in terms of SQUEP. So that and then OTIF, uh, those two scorecard apps in Retail Link are really key for, for being able to have any clue of what's going on for uh, compliance for your company. So, or at least in the in the Walmart business, of course. Um, but those are the, there's two major ones in retail link, um, fix it, which will, I don't think be getting into, uh, that much this time. Um, that one is more for kind of like a granular look at the individual, uh, issues, right? It's called the fix it app. Basically they're going to say, Hey, this packaging wasn't right. Um, they'll take a picture of it. They'll put it up. They'll give you a ticket and then they'll want to know what your supplier action is. How are you going to change this? kind of issue. Um, fix it does a lot more than that too. It's kind of interesting. Um, it, it's not a dispute portal, so I don't want to perpetuate that idea. Excuse me. Um, but you can get more information, we'll just say, on a particular fine, a particular ticket through fix it and use that information um, to generate a better dispute which you would do in high radius the third party platform that walmart is using for basically compliance fines any ar deduction any ar charge even you will see in high radius um, and you can also dispute ar 
deductions, AR chargebacks, you can dispute. So that's OTIF fines and SQUEP fines that are invalid. You can dispute in high radius. Uh, some AR, let's call them uh, fees, like the collect pickup program fees, I believe also happen through high radius. You can't dispute those because those are just, yeah. So uh, for, for the most part, anytime Walmart is sending you uh, an invoice for a some kind of compliance issue, uh, a lot of that will be happening through high radius. Basically, you can think of it in terms of you have high radius over here for AR deductions, and then you have APDP uh, over here for your uh, accounts payable deductions. And all of it should be, you should be able to monitor all of it through those two uh, platforms and also do your disputes through those platforms too. So we will spend, the, the last section on today's webinar will be on high radius. Uh, we'll be just kind of going over, you know, in, in the most generic sense, how to make a dispute for a squat fine uh, in that process. So stay tuned for that. All right, I'm gonna speed up here a little bit. I wanna keep us on track. Uh, I've touched on the Fix-It portal a little bit already, so this we can kind of uh, gloss over. There's more information there about what that corrective action is, what, what, that, what that means, what they're looking for. Uh, you can click into individual tickets. That's where the photos are gonna be. And those photos are really important, um, honestly, for, for winning back uh, disputes on invalid ones for, for doing kind of validity checks on AR deductions and also for uh for fixing it for for taking corrective action you know who's who's the kind of where where is the issue in the supply chain right those pictures will will be good at giving you a better sense of that ideally some of them are very poor quality uh so the so it's not always it's not always clear what's wrong and sometimes those can be clarified or sometimes um uh uh, more information can be requested through the chat function. Uh, the chat feature is really what Fixit is all about. Um, I don't think that we have anything on that, too much on that here. So I'll talk about it a little bit. The chat function is basically you get one chance to give a really good question to someone at Walmart who will uh, have access, uh, for lack of a better term, to the problem. So you've got to word that question very specifically and you can get a specific response. Uh, so again, fix it is not where you do disputes. It's not where you actually kind of make a dispute for a squat fine, but we have seen through the chat, some fines get removed, right? So some people, sometimes you're looking at pictures and it's like, this is not, this is not our stuff, right? So you ask that question in the chat and then it will ideally go away. Right. So that has happened before. We know that that's happened before with other people. Um, the chat function is probably the most beneficial from a revenue loss perspective uh, for getting insight, extra insight beyond what is covered in the actual ticket itself. But here's the here's the dashboard. Here's what the tickets look like. Um, you got your statuses there, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, too. They're all very intuitive. Um, but yeah, the ticket ID is the individual kind of issue. And then all of those they're going to want you to touch on in one way or another. So there's that. Uh, these are the intuitive statuses I don't want to spend too much time on. But basically, you have uh, supplier, Walmart, um, assignees. So uh, when, you, when you receive a ticket, basically, they're saying there's something wrong. We think it's this. Here's this photo from the D.C., and they're awaiting your corrective action, right? Now that doesn't necessarily mean like, hey, dispute this or don't. What that means basically is just Walmart's being like, we we need you to change something here. Um, but as as is the case with all forms of of compliance at any company, you know, it's not always exact. So it is the responsibility of the supplier to make sure that those fines are legit to to follow to follow up on them and to be clicking through those images and. Honestly, well, this will be kind of this is maybe more my axe to grind or or my opinion from what I've gained from talking to suppliers and other people is just that when it comes to SQUEP and OTIV, you need to have a mindset, a, a get better mindset. That's what we say at supply at supply pike. It's really hard to win back compliance fines, even invalid ones, even ones that you can really prove 
you know, this wasn't an issue. When it comes to Squapanotif, basically, if you can make it as as unlikely as possible to be kind of above reproach with your shipping methods uh, so that you're avoiding fines entirely in the first place, that's just the preferred method. It's so much easier than having to go through and get all the documents, right? With AP deductions and with shortages, that's a different issue. You know, the, the shortages, you're just going to be hit with a certain number of them all the time. Walmart is going to is going to give you a certain number of invalid deductions for shortages all the time. And so so disputing is super important for getting that revenue back whenever it comes to AP deductions. So that's where we say uh, there's kind of two sides of this coin. The get paid side, I think, a, a pl applies a lot more to the AP deduction side of things. And the AR chargebacks side of things, I think, is a lot more about how can we just avoid these in the first place, right? So again, it's easier said than done. Um, so I won't. Anyways, <laughs> the point of that whole thing is to just uh, w when you're in fix it, whenever you're trying to take corrective action, um, I think that Walmart's language there is actually kind of helpful because uh, it it does make it easier on the supplier's end um, in the long run, avoiding those altogether. So we've touched on this a lot. It's basically phase two and three fines that fix it is is relevant for. Obviously, th there's not going to be PO information in there. That doesn't mean it's completely disconnected from phase one, from, from POs generally. Of course, a mistake on a PO can lead to a bunch of other mistakes too uh, that, are, that are relevant for phases two and three. But fix it is the nitty gritty of the shipments themselves. It's pictures of this is how it arrived or this is, yeah, this is what was wrong with the packaging. So that's what's really going on there. All right, speaking of POs, uh, we're going to get into it now with uh, phase one. So I've talked about this kind of briefly. For those of you who don't know, maybe some of you are newer suppliers or you're you're kind of learning about SQUEP, whatever your position is, has not required for you to uh, be completely literate on all things SQUEP for whatever reason, right? SQUEP was announced in 2021 with four phases and there are only three active phases. And we haven't heard a single whisper about phase four in a long time. So phase four, you know, it's of course it will come at some point, um, but basically there's three active phases and there's been three active phases from basically the beginning. So the, the first one is really the most fundamental. It's the most important. It's about PO accuracy, which is kind of just everything, right? It's kind of replenishment. It's, it's sort of just kind of touching right on the heart of the issue. PO accuracy is more of a kind of uh, electronic, we'll just say, form of compliance than the phases two and three, which are more kind of manual on the shipments themselves. We talked about fix it. Uh, but yes, basically, how how accurate are your shipments to what's actually being ordered um, is, is what phase one is about, the right item on the right invoice. That's Walmart's language. So this this says here that it's it's um it's about defects that are occurring at or around the receiving process of Walmart DCs and FCs, but it is kind of also the electronic process that is happening before that in the form of POs and ASNs. So um, highly recommend reading up on ASNs. Uh, this might be more relevant for people who are more uh, boots on the ground than higher ups, but it's good to know. <laughs> uh, ASNs are the, the EDI code for that, the EDI document that um, that's referring to is the 856. So that can be helpful for some people as well, but they're absolutely essential for phase one. So if you're going to be disputing a, a, an ASN not downloaded um, uh, squat fine, you'll you'll need the EDI itself. So, uh, or you'll, you'll need the, the ASN. You also need the proof of that it was received, which we'll talk about later too. I think that's an EDI 900 something, but it all, everything is an EDI. Uh, so, there's a code for that, we would say. So these should be sent to Walmart as close to the time of shipping as possible. That would be, um, that's our kind of rule of thumb. Most of the ASN not downloaded fines that suppliers are receiving are a timing issue, right? It's most of, like, like let's say 99 times out of 100, and that's not, that's not a real number. But most of the time, 
it's not a problem with an EDI provider. It's not an electronic issue. It's a problem of shipment has been received before the EDI has been officially um, seen by the receivers, right? So again, it's all about how can you make it as difficult as possible for Walmart to make a mistake in, in their kind of receiving process. So it's all about getting that ASN in front of someone before the shipment is there, um, but preferably not too far before. Um, so yeah, so that's our rule of thumb. As close to the time of shipping as possible, you know, electronic uh, uh, EDI moves faster than than shipments do. So uh, it will get there before if it's sent at that time. And again, most of the time, it's not an EDI issue. Most of the time, it's not an EDI provider problem. Now, again, let us know if your experience has been different um, on that issue as well. So I, I've been mentioning ASN not downloaded, if that doesn't make any sense to you. It's one of the more common SQUEP finds, SQUEP defects, as they call them. Um, uh, we have a we have a great uh, resource on SQUEP defects, the most common SQUEP defects that uh, uh, Danielle can send in the chat. If if you're curious more about what are the particular issues that people are seeing a lot of, um, it's a it's an invaluable resource for someone higher up who wants a good kind of bird's eye view of you know what what are the things that our company that we are seeing that are different from those uh, those others? How can you benchmark your SQUEP performance um, that way? So ASN not downloaded, it's one of the most common. It's not one of the most costly though. So that's something to remember too. Um, some SQUEP finds are much more costly than others uh, for, for an individual company. ASN not downloaded tends to be very common and very costly, but not necessarily the most costly per defect, if that makes sense. So, uh, but again, you know, uh, apples and oranges. So your individual issues, your individual benchmarking could be completely different from the average. So this is how the fines are calculated. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but oftentimes this is, this is, this could be a very helpful resource to have on hand. So, you know, go back and download this slide deck, keep this on hand just so that you have a, a sense of what's actually going on there. So basically um, there's the flat fee, and then there's also a charge multiplied by the number of cases affected. So that's what's going on there with those PO fines. Um, and it seems like it seems like you know you want to avoid um, that the number of cases affected isn't usually the really costly portion of that, but those numbers can add up too. Uh, so. Here's this charge example. I also want to call out uh, defects per million is kind of the is kind of the the way that these are talked about. And um, there's a number of rabbit holes I'm really tempted to kind of dive into, and and uh, <laughs> kind of related to that. But we won't necessarily. Basically, what matters is you know how compliant are you? In this case, it's you are 95.7 percent compliant. You've got uh, three defects on 70 lines. So not bad. Your defects per million is going to be around 43,000. And that'll be one of the first things that you see on your SQUEP dashboard. So your SQUEP dashboard is also broken down by, by individual phases. So check all that out. Um, defects per million to me is confusing. Uh, I see the 43,000 and that doesn't mean anything to me right away. So probably it takes a lot of exposure before it's a metric that really kind of works for you. Uh, what helps me a lot more is that percentage. You know, what is the PO accuracy? What is our average PO accuracy? Which is, I believe, also pretty highly visible in the um, in the app SQUEP dashboard. But yeah, defects per million is kind of the way that they're looking at it. Now, here we've got some, uh, the, the, these are the individual defects I was talking about before, their descriptions and the, the charges. So this is a Walmart uh, supplier facing document. Um, that is, it's basically just a screenshot of that. This should be in the secondary packaging guide is probably where this comes from, but there's basically, there's basically two big ones here that I want to call out. I've already talked about the ASN not downloaded, um, and, uh, overages. Overages are a whole can of worms. So we, overages are a SQUEP defect. They're a SQUEP defect, but there's also... Um, 
something that we've been just calling billable overages, which is usually connected to a squat defect, but it's kind of a different thing. So it, again, like with anything in accounting, it's it's it can become very confusing how um, how it's depending on how it's talked about. Um, but yes, if you exceed, you know, if you go over the quantity ordered um, on the PO, Walmart will hit you with a fine for that. Right now, you can. Um, now that's it. Well, so it's a double whammy. You're losing money because you've sent more than what they paid for. So there's there's a, a certain amount of revenue that's being lost there technically, and then you're getting hit with an AR fine as well. So that's a double whammy. What a lot of people do and what a lot of people have success with, if you can catch it, is you just you just charge Walmart. You invoice Walmart for that extra stuff. You won't get your sweat fine back because that is, you know, uh, it, it's a legitimate fine in that case. Um, but you will be able to get some of that, you know, your money for the stuff back. Well, Walmart has been good about that in the past is what I'll say. So maybe it's not every time. Um, but if you can prove, uh, if they're, if they're hitting, if they're fining you for an overage, um, what that should kind of trigger in your head is like, all right, let's invoice them for, for whatever they're charging us for over. Right. Um, but you do have to do kind of validity checks and it's very confusing. Most of the time an overage is connected to a shortage, which is an AP deduction. So it helps, uh, uh, little kind of, um, uh, shameless plug. It helps to have a lot of oversight into all of that. Um, supply pike, what makes supply pike amazing is that, um, you don't need to do all that work manually on your own and all those different portals. Uh, supply pike can basically find all those shipping documents for you to to know whether a shortage is legitimate or not. Um, and now we can also connect shortages to overages and make that whole process a lot easier for you too. That's a lot on overages. We, we do, we have whole webinars on overages and we're gonna continue to have more whole webinars on overages because they are just so scary and complicated and really frustrating. Um, but it is technically a PO violation as well. So that's something that's important to remember too. Um, you can be hit with that too. All of these other deductions that you see, or sorry, these defect descriptions that you see here and their definitions, they're all important. They're all not very common, okay? So those first two are gonna represent a huge portion of the revenue loss for phase one defects, okay? Those two are very important. Um, all of the others are also important, also things that you want to avoid. Uh, also things that you should know about, um, but those two are going to be the the real kickers. So watch out for those. Oh, also, um, okay, we'll get into this now. ASM not downloaded. Uh, this, again, you, you're going to see a huge, generally, most suppliers see a huge number of these, and um, that number is not necessarily proportional to a massive amount of revenue loss. Um, they are, you can think of them as a more affordable defect than, than an overage, right? Overages are usually, uh, uh, that should be, there should be alarm bells going off because that's Walmart basically just telling you like, hey, we have more of your stuff than we paid for. Uh, but ASM not downloaded, this can be very common. It's usually a timing issue, supply chain, anything, usually a timing issue, right? So I know I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, very common, but it can mean any number of things uh, related to when this is actually sent. Uh, if the ASN never arrived at Walmart, uh, I've heard some people saying that they don't use ASNs, and I and I don't I don't my brain can't comprehend that. So that must be at a certain size. Uh, whenever you're doing a certain number of shipments into Walmart, um, once you reach a threshold, then you start using ASNs. But I'm just not sure how it would work without it, or what would kind of take its place. Um, if it's just everything is based off of the PO. Um, so yeah, again, let us know if if, if you if you don't use ASNs, uh, if you know that your company doesn't use ASNs, let us know in the chat because that's something that is um, kind of mind boggling to me. So ASN never arrived, you know, potentially human error, it just isn't sent, right? Obviously there's gonna be a fine. Um, this is a big one, ASN arrived at Walmart after the shipment. That's what it's gonna be, I think most of the time. Um, but there's a possibility that Walmart rejected the ASN code the, uh, or the ASN. Um, and another one was not submitted before the arrival of the shipment. That's another way of kind of saying the same thing in some of the others. 
uh, and then other forms of, of human error. Potentially, you know, I, I've been saying that there's not an EDI issue. Potentially, there could be an EDI issue, right? So I, I don't want to rule out that possibility either. That's something that needs to be taken into consideration whenever these are, are being looked into. So the best way to avoid, I've mentioned this already, you can familiarize yourself with the EDI codes. I, I've sent a link there to a really helpful article that will kind of go through. I think that article is just the EDI 800 uh, codes. We have, there, there, there's a bunch of other uh, EDI codes that are relevant um, to this whole process, but uh, that's really what we're kind of like zooming in on here. And then the EDI 824s uh, are, are the indication that there's a problem. Um, and those are some of the problems that could be showing up there too, right? The uh, GLN, if it's not valid, that'll screw everything up uh, or um, any kind of invalid UPC um, could be connected to that too. But again, most of the time it's about, you wanna, you wanna shoot for that simultaneous to the departure, um, sending out the ASN. Uh, it's pretty close to when it will be arriving, ideally, knock on wood. Uh, but it will probably, the shipment will probably not get there before the ASN, right? So if you're sending it around the time of departure, um, there's that. I want to call out the ASN not downloaded verbiage is just not helpful. It's not a good description of what's really going on there. Um, that makes it sound like an EDI issue. ASN not downloaded. A lot of suppliers are confused about this. They're like, okay, so there must be something wrong with the with our document. Um, if it's not, if they can't download it, if that's what that means. Um, so, uh, very confusing language in my opinion, unless there's something else there that I'm not aware of. Um, most of the time it's about your ASN showing up pretty, uh, um, in a pretty timely way. Um, and before the shipment arrives, that's, that's the big thing. Um, another thing I want to call out too, with this is the EDI 997 functional acknowledgement. That's, that's Walmart, um, indicating that they've received it. So if you're going to dispute an ASN not downloaded, um, fine, and uh, then then you'll need the EDI 997. That's that's your kind of like golden ticket. Um, if Walmart has communicated through EDI that they have received the ASN and that that reception was before Walmart is telling you that they have received the shipment, then yeah, it's an invalid fine and something else is going on. Um, so that would be that would be an instance when you could dispute and hopefully win something back. For the ASN not downloaded. Um, these are uh, other kind of um, sort of tangential uh, resources relating to this. Uh, obviously, the order management system um, and Nova getting all of the all of that right. Uh, super important. The uh, ASN dashboard is is basically the squat dashboard just for ASN. So to give you kind of a, a a an overview of your performance uh, as far as that goes but uh it can help a little bit with if you want to do some root cause analysis with certain kind of repetitive issues um it can be very good for for that so highly recommend doing some kind of audit uh with that as well um as as you have the capacity to <laughs> um so overages, I've talked about this a lot already. I don't want to spend too much time on it. These are just very important. The ASN not downloaded and overages, they're both phase one defects. They're both very important. They're very common and they can be devastating. So um, I do want to I do want to do my due diligence with it. The technical definition is not a misnomer, right? I think this one is named correctly. The technical definition can be uh it's not, it's, I guess it's not always that simple, right? And that's how, that's how that goes for everything that you see in the um, secondary packaging guide. Uh, but the PO line shipped exceeds the quantity ordered. Yeah, probably. And it might be connected to a bunch of other things, right? Sometimes Walmart will just have internal miscommunication errors where they believe at this DC we're receiving uh, 90 and at this DC we're receiving 10, but really, um, what was actually an agreement all along was 80 and 20. And what you'll do is you'll get a shortage and you'll get an overage and there'll be this huge kind of um, tangling of all the wires. And what needs to happen then is, yeah, that higher level insight, a higher level oversight where you can connect this shortage and this overage and and invoice for what's overed and, and dispute the shortage. Um, that, I mean, that's ideal whenever you can have that kind of high level to it. Um, and that's, that's a, 
I'm not that that's an example, right? So that's not what's happening every time that you get an overage. Sometimes you just ship over. Sometimes there's an edit in the order that, that you don't receive until it's too late and it's already sent and then they're going to hit you with an overage. So um, all of that is happening alongside all of the other supply chain issues alongside replenishment and and sales and everyone. So um, yes, you can have it for any number of reasons. So um, these are dangerous, right? They can be very costly. Um, they could be connected to uh, returns allowance issues. So uh, look out for that as well. And then as I've already mentioned a billion times, can be connected to a shortage too. So um, all of that is should be pretty helpful information for that too. Again, though, the cool thing about overages is it's Walmart basically being like, they're, they're hitting you with a fine. That's uncool, right? The cool thing though, is it's kind of like, hey, we have more of your stuff. So invoice us for it. That's how I would, that's how we can kind of put a positive spin on this. Um, this is what we're going to invoice you for um, is, is kind of what it's communicating ideally, right? So obviously accurate labeling, uh, obviously ASNs, having having your POs uh, all in a row um, and, and having a lot of congruence, between the POs and the ASNs and all of that, super ideal. That's what we're really looking for with the overages. But yeah, easier said than done. Okay, I'm gonna uh, speed up a little bit. I see that we've got some activity in the chat, which is exciting. And if there are questions, I wanna make sure that we have some time for it um, before 12 o'clock, because I don't wanna go over that just in case y'all have other meetings you gotta get to and stuff. Um, so basically barcode and labeling compliance is phase two. That's what's really going on there. Uh, you can think of it kind of as things are becoming more granular as we go through the phases. So phase three is like the materials that are being used. Phase two is the the kind of external stuff, the, the transition from the, the electronic side of things to the shipping materials themselves. What, what is being communicated about what's internal? Um, on those cases and on those individual shipments. So um, yes, how can we make it as easy as possible for Walmart to identify, label, and receive these cases? And as automation is becoming more ubiquitous, um, these are becoming more important. So very, uh, um, really important moving forward, I would say, phase two. It's really important to watch out for these. Um, so uh, the secondary uh, packaging supply chain standards, these page numbers are for the most recent one, um, but these page numbers will change all the time. So watch out for that as well. But the secondary packaging supply chain standards, you all should have some uh, degree of familiarity with. If you don't, you know, we have a resource on that as well. Um, but going straight to the source and just reading it, uh, some of that will be very granular, very detailed, um, uh, much too detailed for the kind of like higher level executive sort of insight that we're talking about right here um, and more relevant for logistics teams and all of that. But again, it's really it's really important to have a cross functional um, view of these things. Otherwise, um, uh, any number of, of of miscommunications and bad things can proliferate. So um, that's that. The defect descriptions for phase two, these are pretty vague, but it's good to know Walmart's official language that they have for it, right? Barcode compliance, wrong format, incorrect quantity, incorrect barcode, or other barcode defects is a kind of catch-all there. For the label, it's the same thing. Incorrect quantity, missing or incorrect description, item number, vitamin, uh, vendor stock number, or other labeling defects, right? So it's the same thing, just kind of in a different, um, at a different point of reception and then uh hazmat compliance hopefully you know uh i mean hopefully i probably none of you are are dealing with that at all um but companies that do um ship hazardous materials are usually the only ones are uh, affected by that right if you're not shipping hazardous materials and you're receiving hazmat compliance fines then that should be a pretty easy dispute to win back so uh, basically, and and this is this is a, one of the rabbit holes I'm always tempted to dive into um, is automation and and what that's going to kind of look like in the years to come 
as DCs become more automated. Um, basically, I would like to just, I would like to just kind of, it should be a point of emphasis, right? Um, automation is coming, winter is coming, automation is around the corner. And when it comes, even though it looks like it's a much smaller charge based off of this kind of uh, format, what we see is that the number of uh, dollars lost and the number of charges go up uh, for phase two, and they're probably going to balloon over the next couple of years. So um, this is really important stuff still. It's not as new. It's not as like hot off the press as it once was but it will become more relevant in years to come. So uh, I'm always I'm always on that soapbox um, on these webinars. So sorry if, if this is me just kind of turning into a broken record again, but watch out for that. Um, but basically this the point of this of this slide, of this portion of the presentation is to talk about the difference between inspection and automation, right? So inspection, Obviously, you're going to have an admin fee connected to that because you have actual people going through. And then those uh, fees are kind of projected out into your performance. That's what the defects per million is kind of talking about again, right? So in this case, and this is a this is a rough case, right? If you've got 12 inspected cases and three have defects, then you're at 250 DPM, which is not a very good place to be. Um, and that can be a lot of revenue loss to compliance fines at that point. But that's your example there. And here's your example um, of how that is laid out basically um, with that flat fine for the defect and then the multiplication of the impacted cases. Uh, again, this is a horrible example. Uh, you're 50% compliant. Um, uh, based off of the sample size of the ones that were actually inspected. Um, so there's another example kind of there. Uh, but whenever it comes to the automation fees, uh, you won't have that flat fine, as I mentioned, and then you will just have the charge that is multiplied by the number of cases because they don't, Walmart isn't paying someone to inspect a case. It's just kind of um, everything's coming down the conveyor belt. Um, so again, they can be deceiving. It seems like it could be cheaper, um, but what we've seen is that with DCs that are more heavily automated, those phase two fines just go up. They just, they really blow up. Um, so yes, this is all about kind of connecting that higher level stuff to the, um, to the more granular things in the supply chain packaging standards. Uh, just a little bit there about the SCC 14 barcodes, but Yes, there's a bunch of barcodes that you're going to need, and there's a bunch of different labels that you're going to need, and you have to actually go to the manual to figure all that out. Now, again, uh, is this something for your logistics team? Is this something that your 3PL is dealing with? Um, yeah, it might be something that you want to kind of just wipe, uh, uh, wash your hands of and not feel like it's it's your responsibility, but being able to communicate with those people with a certain degree of detail could be very helpful, I would imagine. And and to give a sense of, I don't know, uh, maybe a, a appreciation for the logistics people in your life uh, who are digging into the secondary packaging supply chain standards on a regular basis. So again, these page numbers are for the 2023, the, the most recent one. We'll probably get a 2024 version in April. Um, so stay stay tuned for that. We'll, we'll be doing a webinar on those updates. Uh, we have a webinar that we always do kind of throughout the year um, on the secondary packaging supply chain standards updates for the year. Um, and then uh, from there, we kind of project a, what is the narrative? Like, what is the philosophy? Why is Walmart making these changes now? And and what's their kind of vision for that? Um, which is something I love to talk about um, because SQUEP is so near and dear to my heart. And the secondary packaging supply chain standards are not so near and dear to my heart uh, personally, but I have spent a lot of time there. So, uh, but yes, definitely these are the more, um, these are the relevant uh, descriptions for each of these sections. So uh, for for uh, labeling compliance defects, you've got your your particular page numbers there, 204 to 211. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of other things that are tangentially related to it. And then you have the more uh, product specific labeling on those pages. So individual, 
individual kinds of products need to be labeled differently. That's where that is. Again, it, it's just something to be aware of to kind of gloss over. Um, if you're in, if you're in uh, logistics, then it's something that you might be a little bit more familiar with already, ideally. So um, barcode compliance here, th these are some pretty common defects. Um, the ones that we see the most often are incorrect quantity, probably, and incorrect barcode. Uh, wrong format and missing barcode, these are common, um, but they are, well, ideally what these are, if you're seeing these, is it's a new supplier situation and it's just about getting caught up to what that format should be, um, where that barcode should go, right? Because missing barcode usually doesn't mean the people shipping it forgot to attach one entirely. It usually just means it's in the wrong place or the automated receiving process couldn't find them or something like that, right? So um, uh, those usually can be fixed uh, uh, easier. Um, they're, they're a little bit more, I would say they're a little bit more connected to their root cause than some of the others are. Incorrect quantity is very broad. It's very vague. That could be an issue with item setup. That could be an issue with uh, with uh, order management, right? It could be it could be any number of things. Um, it could be connected to shortages and overages, like everything else in the world is. So uh, that's why you see a lot more of those. Unfortunately, um, it's not necessarily um, completely connected to its root cause. Is that's the language that I would use for describing that? All right, I'm gonna speed up here a little bit. Um, yes. That you can avoid it um, by by going to these particular pages in the supply chain standards. Um, sometimes there's hard conversations that need to happen with packaging teams and 3PLs. Uh, more often than not, it's uh, that's not the case. It's more just kind of oh, we were all on we all were all not sure of what this new format is or what this new um, barcode and labeling. Um, uh, standard was. And so now we're all getting caught up to speed on it. Um, people have had success um, giving their SQUEP fines, passing them along to their 3PLs in certain instances, <clears throat> um, or their OTIF fines as well. But again, that's, that's a high level business decision that has to be happening between uh, large numbers of teams. So it's not necessarily something we recommend or don't. Um, obviously, you know, it should be fairly easy if you have unlimited resources to dig into everything. It should be fairly easy to to pinpoint the actual issue whenever there's a whenever there's a fine, um, but it's not always the case. It's not always clear if the three PL is if the three PL is at fault or not. So obviously, um, but there's that. Um, now we're getting into phase three a little bit. Uh, this is right condition is the language that Walmart is using um, to describe that. This has to do with packaging, pallet, and load defects. That's how it's broken down. Um, so yeah, again, this is the most granular. It's the more detailed. It's the more material of the three. You're really kind of looking at the actual uh, load quality or the actual um, pallet size and um, and the packaging materials themselves. So here are the kind of uh, here are the definitions for those. But again, you can see that they're more detailed here because we're talking about more detailed things. Um, weak packaging, glue or tape, poor perforations, missing tray, lid, loose wrap, undersized, oversized cases, stuff like that. That's what packaging compliance is about. But if, but of course, you know, they always end these descriptions with or other packaging defects. So it, it can be very broad. Um, you could receive a packaging compliance defect um, uh, that is not necessarily a matter of glue or perforation or something like that. It's just a little bit more broad too. Um, but you can see uh, the their their definition here for pallet labeling, missing shipping label or other pallet uh, labeling defects is very broad, but their pallet descriptions are very specific too with what they're looking for. So um, all of that you can find in the um, secondary packaging standards as well. And then securement is a big one. You see a lot. Uh, and fix it, the pictures of everything all over the place in the back of the truck. And, you know, they're cranky about it. So you get hit with the fine. Um, but their definition there is poor securement, bagged item, missing tray, or other pallet securement defects. Okay. 
So um, some more defect descriptions here that we see fairly often, um, pallet build, pallet quality, um, load stability and load segregation. Again, all these are um, pretty similar to each other and they have some overlap, um, but uh, the more you dig into the supply chain standards, the more uh, uh, clarity you'll have about what these individual defects are. And again, our ref, our resources is very helpful for reorganizing all of that information in a way that is more, I guess, user-friendly to the supplier um, uh, themselves. So uh, definitely check that out. It's a great book. I wrote it. Um, here's an example of what a, uh, a pallet compliance charge might look like. And you've got your defects per million there as well. This poor person is, is not looking good, right? Two thirds compliant. There's that laid out for you as well. Same as the others, but a little different. Um, but yes, these, these, um, slides, I really, uh, I, I recommend for, you know, people who are having to do reporting, you know, um, it can be helpful to, to go through those, um, with, uh, uh, um, someone kind of higher up in a company to, to make these numbers real, um, in that sense. So, uh, yeah, the defect descriptions are super important. Obviously it comes down to having the right packaging materials and, um, and uh, following those instructions. I'm, I'm starting to sound like a broken record there, but um, there's less that we can actually say on a high level about those. Those are all very specific. So for your individual thing that you're shipping, you're gonna need the right kind of labeling and packaging uh, materials. And um, yes, uh, root cause analysis uh, it becomes very important with all of that, right? On the one hand, just having awareness that these fines are coming in, um, but what we see a lot of the time with phase three is not necessarily like a pretty regular cadence of errors that you would just expect like you would with a PO fine is we see a ballooning of errors because of miscommunications about what these packaging materials are supposed to be. And then um, after the root cause analysis has happened and a, a fix it, a change, a get better um, uh, has been has been instantiated there at that problem, then it will kind of tend to go away. So these are root cause analysis is very important for phase three um, defects, um, but they're not as uh, they're not as kind of, I would say regular as the other ones are. Again, this is this information that's coming. That's that's very broad information across a bunch of different categories, right? That's the that's the data that we're pulling from. So in individual categories, that might not be the case, right? It might be just pallet issues for this particular category and it's everyone, every supplier in that category is seeing that. So take all this with a grain of salt. This is benchmarking across all 50 categories. So, or or all categories or most categories, right? It's not necessarily the, the key for your particular issue. All right. Now this is very high level as well. It's It's hard to get detailed with how to make a dispute work in high radius without using individual kind of cases. So basically we're just covering kind of the most general helpful advice. If you are someone who's actually, you know, boots on the ground doing these disputes, um, uh, this this would be a regular part of your training, a part of your life. <laughs> um, yes, high radius would. So, okay, for uh, uh, th these are just helpful documents, you know, obviously, um, uh, to know for any kind of um, SQUEP dispute. Um, but here we have phases two and three outlined, PO number, item number, defect type, DC number, number of impacted cases, right? That could be very important if what you're disputing is the number of impacted cases, uh, as we saw from all those fine examples, right? Um, uh, viewing the images in Fixit, I've mentioned this before, that's really big. It's really big for the big fines, uh, go to those images. Um, they, they'll they be kind of your key for uh, whenever it is invalid. Um, if there's no images there at all, or if, they're, if the images there are weird in one way or another, uh, they'll usually be your key to kind of winning that back too. So sometimes that's really important to attach as well. Um, again, fix it is not the dispute portal. High radius is the dispute portal, but sometimes fines go away and fix it if you ask the right questions. Um, you can make them go away sometimes. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, it'll it'll be key for giving you a sense of what's actually going on there. Um, all right, open and closed bills. Um, uh, the difference there is just, you know, has it been paid off or matched uh, with a transaction, right? So that's all that's going on there, but you can dispute both. Both of them can be disputed. Some people uh, have been confused thinking closed bills can't be disputed, but they can't, okay? So uh, you can, uh, you want to select the charge that you're, um, that you're disputing there in that box. You can do more than one, depending on how they're grouped. Um, and then there's the kind of key information that needs to be filled out. Again, all of this, you know, it depends on, it depends on what the actual defect is. It depends on what the issue is, of course. Um, all of that is changing. Uh, but dispute reason, amount to be disputed, um, comments are almost always applicable, but, you know, um, yeah, the more information that can be included there, the better. And then attachment for relevant documents or those fix-it pictures, stuff like that. Um, after you've populated those boxes, you can save it there in the bottom right corner, of course, and that will file it. And then you can view all of them in the disputes tab there and filter them through, follow up on them, see the supplier action. You know, if, if, if Walmart is going to come back and say, no, we need this from you, um, that's all going to be happening there. And then um, Squep customer service, I haven't heard really, you know, kind of glowing reviews of this process, but I haven't heard very much about it at all. So um, uh, does the HiRad CS email work for you? Is that something that you've had to um, engage with or encounter with? Um, the supplier contact center, we have not, uh, uh, I have not heard um, anything about either. And then, uh, but yes, all of these links, um, you know, um, in, in desperate times call for desperate measures. So uh, who knows what um, will be most kind of important um, for you and your business at that time. Danielle, do we have any questions? Yes, um, a question we got in the chat, and this is related to the ASN's not downloaded slide, Peter. Um, the question is, I have not found a common number in transaction code 997FA relating to the ASN. Who is to say that this 997 is related to the ASN? Uh, that's a great question. The I, I think... Uh, I could be wrong. So take this with a grain of salt too. I think that that's a question for EDI. If if there isn't a if there isn't an EDI 997, then uh your your EDI provider should be able to say if the ASN is actually being sent or not. Um but I think deflecting that question to the EDI provider could be a good place to kind of start that process. Then you'll be able to see okay, if there isn't a 997 that's connected to uh um, the ASN, um, or if you don't know how to connect them to the ASN, my assumption is that that is something that your EDI provider could help with. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a very, it's not a very great answer to your question. That's where I would start. And then, um, beyond that, uh, I'm not sure we have our emails here too. So, um, I will put these up later too, but they're on the slides. So if that doesn't work, um, uh, send me an email and I can follow up with someone else and we can get a better answer for you there. So that'll be important for probably a number of these questions too. Um, and we'll go back there at the end too, if you missed that, um, for our emails. Um, but yeah, I, I would start there with the EDI provider, um, find out who that is. If you're not someone who's in kind of regular communication with them and start that question there. And if that doesn't work, send me an email. Thank you. Um, it looks like we don't have any further questions today, um, but thank you for running through all that content, Peter. And thank you to everyone um, in the chat for joining us. Like Peter said, if you can think of a question later or you'd like to share any insight, please feel free to reach out to us on our email or you can find us at supplypike.supplierwiki.com. We would love to continue that conversation with you guys. Yep. And I uh, just wanted to touch on this a little bit. I was making reference to some of the other resources that we have. Um, Danielle sent that one in the chat too. Um, but if if this is helpful, if this is the sort of thing that's helpful for you and your position, highly recommend checking out everything else. We're, we're now doing stuff on a number of retailers. 
Um, and it's always this, it's always free content. You'll just have to give us your email sometimes or something like that, like you did for the webinar. Um, so definitely check those out as well on our website. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there. So, but yeah, with that, I will stop sharing and we will see y'all next time.